I'm here because it's time for a change. I'm here for you, my children, and my grandchildren. I'm here to show that moderate voices have a stake in this too. Massive job losses, record home foreclosures and evaluations, lost retirement savings. The mess we're in today did not begin on Wall Street. Long before the financial collapse, the dismantling of government regulation was well underway. Vast sums of wealth were already being channeled from the paychecks and bank accounts of everyday taxpayers and into the pockets of the super rich and corporate CEOs. This has been the greatest wealth transfer in the history, at least of um, American kind, if not mankind. This is class warfare. I think it's scaring the hell out of everybody. I think everybody should be scared. In a real-life development dwarfing the most elaborate conspiracy fiction, all of these consequences are the end result of a brilliantly executed coup. Everyday human lives, the common dreams of people everywhere, were never a factor. All that mattered was profit. Who did it? How were they able to pull it off right before our eyes? This is the story of the biggest heist in American history. My grandmother was born into the world of boom and bust, boom and bust, as it had been from 1794 until the Great Depression. Once upon a time, we knew in this country we had a Great Depression, and we had a stock market crash in 1929, followed by several years of 25% unemployment, of corporations declaring bankruptcy, of people in the streets on bread lines. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. In the depths of the Great Depression, President Roosevelt's New Deal put millions back to work, provided unemployment insurance, created social security, and made it easier for workers to join unions and bargain collectively. What FDR and that government had the balls to do was enact legislation that really took command of the Wall Street environment and said, you know what, you can't speculate with other people's money. Coming out of the Great Depression, just three laws fundamentally altered the, the course of America's history. The first one, FDIC insurance, make it safe to put money in banks. The second one, Glass-Steagall, try to separate the risk taking on Wall Street from uh, your local community bank. And the third one, uh, SEC regulations uh, provide some cops to watch the robbers. Out of that, what we got was 50 years of economic peace. No financial panics, no meltdowns. And during that 50 years, we built a strong and prosperous middle class in America. After World War II, the New Deal evolved into a great deal for the American people. Growing prosperity and social justice seemed to be everyone's destiny as the U.S. economy exploded into the greatest economic machine in history. There has never been anything like the America of today, a nation so productive that the typical worker's family is able to afford conveniences and luxuries available only to the privileged few elsewhere. We had the home ownership rate in this country going from about 44% on the eve of World War II to 64% by the mid-60s. We had the blue-collar middle class, and entrepreneurs did beautifully. Corporate America did fine. The New Deal established that ordinary people had the right to protect themselves against corporate abuse. The early 70s expanded those safeguards with the creation of agencies like the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, 
whose mission was to protect workers. The Environmental Protection Agency was created to protect human health and the environment. Regulation is nothing more than the imposition of a set of rules to prevent the free market from behaving in a way which is contrary to the common good. A decision was reached by corporate America that working with unions, uh, working with government to improve the standard of living for all people was not the right thing to do. Big business doesn't like the government to tell it what to do. They don't want anybody to interfere with their ability to make money in the way that they see fit. In 1971, corporate leaders began to orchestrate a detailed battle plan to eliminate any government policies that might stand between them and profits. The plan was laid out in an influential memo called Attack on American Free Enterprise System. Lewis Powell was a well-respected citizen of Richmond, Virginia. He was a corporate lawyer, a partner in a prestigious corporate law firm, and friends with uh, an executive at the Chamber of Commerce named Eugene Sidnor. And Sidnor asked his friend if he would draft a position statement that he could submit to the Chamber of Commerce that would then sort of form the framework for how to make the organization more able to confront what they thought was a, a growing threat to business interests. Powell's memo laid out a strategy to radically alter public perceptions, ensuring that big business interests would dominate public policy. Powell advocated a vast purge of liberal elements in society. He saw how corporate money could own the media and talk louder than organized labor and consumer protection groups. But for Powell, a future Supreme Court justice, the real end game was business control of law and politics you see this memorandum bouncing from desk to desk, from uh, boardroom to boardroom around corporate America, uh, inspiring and inciting uh, business leaders to find a way to get involved and to join what they had already, many of them had already perceived to be a battle for the soul of America and a battle to save free enterprise. To make their point, the Chamber of Commerce created very clever advertising to influence public opinion. What can be done to repair the strength of the nation's economy and restore individual freedom. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the recently formed Elite Business Roundtable, an exclusive club of CEOs, joined forces to lobby Congress and push their agenda with major campaign contributions. Their goal? To buy congressional votes to implement a corporate makeover of America. You had massive lobbying beginning in 76, 77, 78, for cutting taxes on rich people, trickle-down economics, cut capital gains taxes, cut dividend taxes, cut income taxes, and the economy will flourish. Some of the Democrats start drinking the Kool-Aid along with the Republicans. Next, big business set its sights on the biggest threat to their bottom line, the wages and benefits of the American workforce, especially union members who, starting in the 1930s, had won bargaining power for wages, working conditions, and benefits. But instead of negotiation, big business wanted control. Lewis Powell, the Powell Memo. Businessmen should use their financial muscle to shape the politics of the country nor should there be reluctance to penalize politically those who oppose it. By 1978, business outspent organized labor three to one to defeat a bill that would have made it easier for workers to join unions. This was a critical turning point, setting in motion the decline of organized labor as a major political force and the voice of working Americans. Douglas Frazier, president of the United Auto Workers, said in a magazine interview at the time, I believe leaders of the business community, with few exceptions, have chosen to wage a one-sided class war today in our country, a war against working people, the unemployed, the poor, the minorities, the very young and the very old, and even many in the middle class of our society. Mr. 
one of the geniuses of the right in the United States is they funded these 12 big Washington organizations, Heritage, Cato, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, organizations that range from quite principled Cato to complete shills, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, for the causes of their donors. Heirs to six of the largest family fortunes in the United States use their private foundations to fund organizations that would promote unregulated markets. One notable one would be uh, the role of Joseph Coors at the Heritage Foundation, who constantly cited the Powell Memo as one of the reasons that he was inspired to create a uh, conservative pro-business think tank uh, that he called Heritage. Well, Heritage is a conservative think tank, and if you read the back of our business cards, it says, building an America where freedom, opportunity, prosperity, and civil society flourish. And that's Heritage's goals. Working in unison, the six families use their private foundations to shape business schools and manipulate the media. Most of all, they wanted to restructure government to serve their own interests. They're not think tanks. These are not academic research organizations. These are ideological marketing organizations. They're no different than the people who persuaded young men when I was a young man that we should put Brill cream in our hair. You know, add grease to your hair. It'll make you attractive to the girls. These economic royalists complain that we seek to overthrow the institutions of America. What they really complain of is that we seek to take away their power. Even in the Great Depression, when 25% of Americans were out of work, you had these apologists for free market fundamentalism argue against increased government spending, increased regulation, strengthening the hands of unions, a stronger safety net. The same thing is happening today. The motive was, was ideological, putting uh, millions and millions of dollars into funding uh, right-wing ideas factories. But then those ideas needed to get pushed out into the media. Well, the kind of narratives that, that, uh, that Republicans have used and conservatives have used have, have come out of 40 years and tens of billions of dollars worth of efforts by uh, conservative think tanks. Uh, to try to develop just the right kind of words to use. Well, Republicans were the ones that pushed through President Bush's tax policy in 2001 that lowered the death tax. To the broad question of how it was that the right managed to get people who shouldn't have voted for them to vote for them uh, is, is obviously the million-dollar question. But when it came to something like the estate tax, well, the, the way the, the law was originally written, no one was affected by the estate tax except the extremely rich. But, of course, the way they talked about it was brilliant. Uh, and it's the most unfair tax there is. They've already paid taxes on this money when they made it. They paid capital gains taxes along the way. And here we are at death, and we're going to hit them again. When you say death tax, what you say is, wait a minute. Now they're taxing you for dying? For God's sakes, they tax me when I make the money. They tax me when I spend it. Now they're going to tax me for dying. No, th I've had enough. And what the Republicans understood was you test those kind of things until you find that kind of language that really resonates with people. My plan will give businesses tax incentives that result in plant expansion, greater output, and more jobs. It'll remove regulations that shoot up the cost of doing business. Strong creative leadership can restore America as the mightiest industrial nation on Earth. The time is now for Reagan. It all comes together in the election of 1980. Uh, where the right had built up this powerful political and financial and intellectual infrastructure, and it all comes together under Reagan. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly So by the time Reagan takes office, there is an Reagan army of policy wonks who have a whole game plan that can be put into effect very, very quickly to deregulate everything that hasn't been deregulated under Carter. First play I America saw Ronald Reagan as someone trustworthy. As the host of television's General Electric Theater, his charm kept us from noticing that he was there to sell appliances. As president, he became our national host. But in his portrayal of a statesman, Reagan's policies followed the Powell Memo script, serving the big business interests that financed his campaign. Heritage produced something first for the Reagan administration. And what this was was a catalog of how Heritage felt that government programs should be changed, reformed, eliminated, started, et cetera, 
to best uh, meet conservative goals. The newly elected president handed out the Heritage Foundation's mandate for leadership to every member of his cabinet. For the next eight years, this anti-government policy guide drove the Reagan administration's makeover of federal government from protecting the public good into working for the rich and powerful. Ronald Reagan is my hero. Why is he my hero? He gave us pride. He gave us loyalty. He gave us patriotism. He brought back our position in the world. He brought us out of darkness and into light. He cut taxes for those at the top. Instead of balancing the budget, he ran the biggest deficits in history. Then he presided over the passage of a series of tax increases on ordinary people, only he didn't call them that. The Washington Press Corps went along with the White House calling these revenue enhancements. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. It was attacking government, attacking the institutions of government, and uh, trying to make it as a system that doesn't work. And uh, in, in reality, uh, rich folks don't need governments. They live in their own gated communities. They have their own security. They swim in their own swimming pools. They go to their own private schools. Rich people take care of themselves. The ideology of the free market that said that if we allowed them to just use their own creativity and be able to do what they want, that the wealth that they created would trickle down to create jobs and, and create consumer goods and, and make America an even richer and more prosperous society than it was. Well, all that was beautiful theory. You either believe in it or you don't. The whole idea of a free market is a myth to begin with. Markets are structured based on laws. And the real issue is who the structure benefits. And there's just no question that uh, when Ronald Reagan came in, the target of Reaganomics was the labor movement. One of his first acts was to destroy the uh, air traffic controllers, which was a signal to all American businesses that it was open season on unionism. They are in violation of the law, and if they do not report for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their jobs and will be terminated. They understand that it's not just about labor supporting the interests of members of labor unions, but it has been the labor movement that has supported the interests of all workers. You wouldn't have Social Security. You wouldn't have unemployment compensation. You wouldn't have Medicare. You wouldn't have all of these things, which are not just for labor union members. As the bumper sticker says, they are the people who brought you the weekend. He was able to pull off an ideological counter-revolution. And by the time he was over, uh, most of the New Deal had been dismantled. While Reagan was breaking unions and demolishing regulations, he also convinced Congress in 1981 to pass his Economic Recovery Tax Act, cutting the top tax brackets by nearly a third, but raising taxes on the middle class. By dramatically increasing the Social Security tax, as recommended by Alan Greenspan to Ronald Reagan, we shifted the burden of government so that today, 70-some percent of Americans pay a heavier share of their income in Social Security and Medicare taxes than they do in income taxes. And we push the burden down. At the same time, at the very, very top, we radically cut taxes so that the 1,000 richest men, women, and children in America face an effective total federal tax rate, Social Security and income taxes, about 17 cents on the dollar and their average income is $263 million. After decades of lobbying driven by corporate money, the tax code is now full of loopholes and special deals that help big business avoid paying its fair share. To avoid paying taxes, U.S. corporations have stashed more than $1.5 trillion in offshore accounts. 
corporations only pay 13% of the federal budget's revenues. Out of two and a half trillion dollars, corporations only pay 13%. So I just want to list some 10, the 10 worst corporate tax avoiders. ExxonMobil, largest oil company in the world, made 19 billion in profits in 2009. Exxon not only paid no federal income taxes, it actually received a $156 million rebate from the IRS over the past five years, while General Electric made $26 billion in profits in the United States. It received a $4.1 billion refund from the IRS. So if you're working stiff, you're making thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year, you're paying taxes, but if you're Chevron and you made $10 billion in profits in 2009, you don't have to pay any taxes. You get a $19 million refund. Yeah, let's go after the little kids. Let's go after the elderly. Let's go after the sick. Let's go after the most vulnerable. But apparently in the Senate, we can't ask Chevron to pay taxes. The Powell memo recommended constant surveillance of content in textbooks, newspapers, magazines, radio, and television, insisting that big business use the media to convince Americans that an end to business regulation would somehow benefit us all. For 38 years, the Federal Communications Commission had enforced the Fairness Doctrine, which mandated that all broadcasts over public airwaves offer a balance of viewpoints. In 1987, Ronald Reagan stopped enforcement of the Fairness Doctrine, opening the floodgates for corporate money to talk directly to America through the media. A few years ago, uh, studies were showing that uh, of the 350 uh, top radio markets in the country, you had something like 90% of uh, right-wing talk and less than 10% of progressive talk. Media deregulation is a big story. I think it's a threat to democracy. Most people don't have any idea what's going on. After his 1992 election, Democratic President Bill Clinton continued to implement key elements of both the Powell Memo and the Heritage Foundation's prescriptions for government by and for big business. In 1996, Clinton signed the first major overhaul of telecommunications law in 62 years. People have to understand that now there are just a handful of corporations that own the media and every one of them has an agenda. Comcast now owns 51% of our national broadcasting network. What Rupert Murdoch thinks, right? is more likely to be what you think than anything else. They missed major stories. We know they missed major stories. And that is all coming home to roost now. I think the media is awful. Awful. They don't do in-depth reporting. They distort the news story to show the, the, the most confrontational headline. They don't do in-depth news gathering. Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. Our intelligence sources tell us that he has attempted to purchase high-strength aluminum tubes suitable for nuclear weapons production. 20 years ago, nobody who was in journalism thought anything of saying to a politician to his face, Senator, stop lying to the Los Angeles Times. General, you know that's not true. I know that's not true. Uh, today, if you said something like that, you'd be fired. You would be fired. We don't ask tough questions. And we have these orchestrated White House press conferences. And Obama is actually worse than his predecessor, George Bush, on this issue. All right, so with that, let me see who's on the list. We're going to start with Jake Tabor. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, the business press and the financial news networks, and certainly uh, in recent years, CNBC have been uh, cheerleaders for uh, free market ideology uh, and, and for business and for the business class. If you take your financial advice from CNBC, you're going to go broke. Okay, Peter writes, should I be worried about Bear Stearns in terms of liquidity and get my money out of there? No, no, no. 
Bear Stearns is fine. Bear Stearns shares are down 90% this morning, and it's not just Bear. Pretty much every single bank is plunging in early trade this morning. But you don't get the information that you need, and you're pretty much on your own. The same thing that's happened in business has happened in broadcasting. It's just completely profit-driven. U.S. Steel is getting out of the steel business, and they're getting out of this community. And they're saying, goodbye, we had enough, there's no more left, we squeezed the grape, we're going on to greener pastures. We've seen the acceleration of the hollowing out of America as the most important and powerful industrial society on Earth. Since 1973, approximately 40 million good-paying American jobs with benefits have been shipped overseas or dismantled by corporations, boosting their own profits at working Americans' expense. Thanks to decades of policy shaped by corporate money, there was nothing to stop them. There is this notion that this was only a Republican uh, villainy, when in fact, uh, much of what happened happened during the eight years of Bill Clinton. We seek a new and more open global trading system, not for its own sake, but for our own sake. I supported NAFTA then, and I supported NAFTA now. I still support NAFTA now for the same reason, or the same reasons. The main one is I, like most economists, generically favor trade liberalization because trade leads to gains on both sides. As uh, Jorge Castaneda, who was later finance minister of Mexico, once said, he said, NAFTA was a arrangement between the rich and powerful of all three countries, leaving ordinary people out. What that really means in simple language is that corporations are able to move anywhere in the world they want to, to seek cheap labor and exploit people and use that as leverage against workers here in the United States of America. Now, if you just want to get out of brass tax, if you're paying $12, $13, $14 an hour for factory workers, and you can move your factory south of the border, pay a dollar an hour for your labor, have no health care, that's the most expensive single element making a car, have no environmental controls, no pollution controls, and no retirement, and you don't care about anything but making money, there will be a giant sucking sound going south. If you look at the statistics since NAFTA, in all three countries, the wages of workers have been stagnant, the productivity of workers has skyrocketed, and workers in all three countries have gone into debt in order to maintain their living standards. We also saw a massive uh, movement toward unfettered free trade. And the theory of that was that if uh, you create trade agreements with China uh, where people are paid 40, 50 cents an hour and you shut down plants in America and you move to China and you move to Mexico, that in some way that we haven't quite figured out yet, uh, this is going to be good for the American worker. For 20 years, the American public believed we could simultaneously outsource all of our jobs and simultaneously maintain our quality of life at home. We thought we could do that. Guess what? No such thing. We can't have our cake and eat it, too. We are eviscerating our manufacturing capability, all in the name of lower prices, all in the name of free trade, all in the name of the market always knows best. The market doesn't know best. I'm Kim Berry. Um, through the 1980s, I was living the American dream, and that was really the, the high point of my career. I didn't know it at the time but I was earning $50 an hour as a consultant in 97 at Hewlett Packard when I left HP to do um, a dot-com venture. And HP at the time said, that's great. If it doesn't work out, you always have a job here. And in fact, whatever you learn in dot-com, that'll be valuable to your long-term career at HP. Offshoring of employment has been with us for a very long time, but has mostly been restricted to manufacturing. The new wrinkle is offshoring of services the number and range and variety of jobs that could, in principle, be done abroad, say, over the internet. It's enormous. What happened while I was out doing the dot-com, HP started bringing in workers from India because they would work for a lot cheaper. And also they brought them in to train them to get some foreigners trained so that they could then ship them back to the, the research and development labs back in India and China. If you look at it, 
in terms of pure business, they're the right decisions. You go to the lowest labor for labor cost. Okay, in 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 terms of uh, uh, what what's what's the right world patriotism, uh, they're not. <laughs> it will be painful, and for a number of reasons. One of them is going to be large. Maybe over the course of the next generation, 30, 40 million jobs. It's important to note this is not either about only low-skilled jobs or only high-skilled jobs. They're all over. If what you do is write computer code, routine computer code, you might as well be anywhere in the world. So it really doesn't matter. Uh, so you, you lose nothing in quality if you move the job from Indiana to India. Paul Craig Roberts, a co-founder of Reaganomics, feels that big business has gone too far. All these ladders are being dismantled. Uh, wh where, where are the jobs for university graduates? They are now beginning to face the same dilemmas that blue collar workers face when they lost their $20 an hour manufacturing jobs with their good benefits. And so we have an economy that is starting to impoverish its workforce. An infinite number of people coming who are taking jobs that pay over 100000 a year. You know, they're going to pay taxes. We create lots of other jobs around those people. You know, my, my basic view is that the country should welcome as many of those people as we can get. And what the corporations are doing, they tell Congress, oh, there's a shortage of engineers. There's a shortage of scientists. We can't find any. This is all an absolute total lie. With the HR Many manage, corporations we... will go to any lengths, including these legal but deceptive practices, to hire cheaper foreign labor. Look at this video clip recorded at a seminar conducted by an American law firm for human resources professionals. And our goal is clearly not to find a qualified and interested U.S. worker. And, you know, that, in a sense, that sounds funny, uh, but it's what we're trying to do here. I get 50 resumes. My God, this is the last thing I want to do is interview these 50 people. Does the law require that I actually interview each and every candidate? You don't have to interview each and every candidate. If it gets to the point where they, somebody's looking like they're very qualified, we ask them to have the manager of that specific position step in and go over the qualifications with them. If necessary, schedule an interview, go through the whole process to find a, a legal basis to disqualify them for this particular position. The present uh, head of GE uh, said that when he looks at the future of his company, he sees China and China and China. So it's, these guys will go where the cheapest labor is. There is no allegiance to the United States of America. Since 2002, GE has reduced its American workforce by tens of thousands of people. In 2008, the global conglomerate received a $140 billion bailout from American taxpayers. GE also spends more money lobbying Congress than any other corporation in the world. In 2011, President Barack Obama appointed GE's CEO, Jeffrey Immel, to run his presidential council on jobs and competitiveness. Have you ever talked with displaced workers yourself? Have I ever talked with this? The fact that I'm thinking this means the answer is either no or almost no. I, I, I can't offhand remember uh, a case. You know, we professors tend to be ivory tower types. <laughs> what they've done for the last 20 years is destroy the ability of people who worked hard and played by the rules to have decent retirements. Big business was not satisfied with just outsourcing jobs and getting huge tax breaks to increase their profits. Corporations also set their sights on eliminating guaranteed pensions. Common stock. Do I own any? I don't even know what they are. Mm -hmm. In the 1950s, stock gets marketed like another consumer item. At the same time, pension funds are starting to change. Why, for example, should a company have to put away that kind of money um, as a liability to pay off its retired workers when instead they could take some out of the paycheck every week and then make you go invest it yourself? And that's what they did. So why not put your money to work? Put my money to work? That's right, Mr. Finchley. 
you can own a share of American business. You know, there's a joke that uh, compensation executives tell each other. What's a four-letter word that starts with an F, ends with a K, and stands for screw your workers? 401K. 401Ks are a subtle kind of pay cut, and they're bad economics. Defined benefit pension plans were on top of your salary. That meant you worked for a company for 30 years or so, you retired, you knew exactly how much money was going to get paid out of the pension because the company kept this pension fund and it kept enough money in it to pay you out. Under a 401k plan, you have to save money out of your paycheck so you have less money. A company may give you a match, but these plans typically save a company 50% or more uh, in the plan. Then you assume all the risks of investing your money. If the average person could manage investments, then why in the world would they pay the gigantic salaries that they do on Wall Street? Adjusted for inflation in the last decade, Retirement savings invested in 401k plans lost nearly a third of their value. Today, state governments are beginning to shift public worker pensions to 401k plans. This social security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens Social Security is an incredibly important benefit. I'm here to support the Social Security benefits that my parents get, and I'm here to support the Social Security benefits that I hope to get and my children hope to get. Social Security is not just a retirement benefit, it's a three-tier benefit. So it helps millions, millions of seniors stay out of poverty and live a decent life in their retirement. But it also helps disabled people. When disabled people need our support as a society, it helps them function. And just as importantly is the survivor benefit so that if working people are killed, unfortunately, in some circumstance, their children will have a source of income. One of the greatest pieces of idiocy ever suggested was privatizing Social Security. Why do it just with pensions? If it works for pensions, take the whole Social Security fund, the one element of the New Deal reform plans that still remains, and put that in the stock market. This had been a goal of the anti-Franklin Roosevelt, anti-New Deal conservatives from the 1930s onwards. It actually came as perilously close to happening as it ever could have under the presidency of George W. Bush. Um, the economic president, I think he calls himself. If you're a younger worker, I believe you should be able to set aside part of that money in your own retirement account so you can build a nest egg for your own future. Here's why the personal accounts are a better deal. Your money will grow over time at a greater rate than anything the current system can deliver. And your account will provide money for retirement over and above the check you will receive from Social Security. Under Reagan, the mandate agenda included not only deregulation of Main Street industries, but the financial industry as well. This set the scene for a future disaster on a scale previously unimaginable, starting with the hundreds of savings and loan bankruptcies of the late 1980s. The financial razzle-dazzle that 30 years later takes down the economy really starts when Wall Street starts inventing all kinds of new gimmicks and the regulators give all this stuff a free pass. Everything has rules. You know, baseball has rules right down to how many stitches are on the baseball. And when you remove the rules, you enable people who behave badly. The purpose of rules is not to regulate saints. It is to deal with people who are sinners. 
Once Wall Street was deregulated, their profits mushroomed. Large commercial banks like Citicorp watched with envy. And in the mid-1990s, they too began fierce lobbying to get their slice of the pie. In 1933, Congress passed a law called the Glass-Steagall Act. And that law said, well, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out if allowing banks to invest in speculative securities brings down the banking system when the market fails, then maybe we shouldn't let them do it. It was very simple. It maintained that commercial banks that were responsible for individuals, deposits, and savings, and lives were kept separate and were backed by the government from the more speculative, risky trading activities of the investment banking community. It works so well that people forget. And in 1999, a genius by the name of Phil Graham, aided by a brilliant president named Bill Clinton who signed the bill, and pushed by a free market ideology that had been peddled to the United States people since the day Ronald Reagan was elected, said, we don't need Glass-Steagall anymore. We haven't had bank panics. Glass-Steagall was the longest lived and most successful financial law ever passed, protecting consumers and investors alike. Within a year of Glass-Steagall's repeal in 1999, President Clinton signed the deceptively named Commodity Futures Modernization Act, deregulating shadowy financial products known as derivatives. One of those instruments, known as the credit default swap, became the prime culprit in the 2008 worldwide financial crisis. The head of the Federal Reserve Bank at the time, Alan Greenspan, endorsed these changes, giving the green light for Wall Street to once again become a casino was Alan Greenspan, was an extreme conservative. And there was a period, you know, in the 90s when Greenspan was widely praised as this genius, and he got out just in time. He got out just before the crash, and his policy of deregulating everything and financing all of this speculation with very cheap money, that's gonna look a lot worse in light of history than it did uh, at the time. He wanted to give Wall Street really a gift at the time, which was cheaper money, which is why he cut rates. And all the speculators take advantage of the very cheap money, and they invent a whole bunch of new toxic stuff, like subprime. In the last 10 years, something crazy happened. The multiple of the value of housing to people's incomes went through the roof. And that was a classic case of a speculative bubble. And uh, this was engineered uh, on Wall Street. Because there was so much trading, there appeared to be demand for mortgages, which meant it appeared there was a demand for homes being sold, which inflated the actual cost of homes. There was some sense that, well, maybe, even if it goes down, we won't be the last company holding the ball. Wall Street paid their chief executives hundreds of millions of dollars for screwing us up and losing our money. And we paid them a huge premium for this. We said, boy, these are really smart guys. They're not smart guys. You and I would never have made those loans. Where do you think you made a mistake then? I made a mistake in presuming that the self-interest of organizations, specifically banks and others, was such as that they were best capable of protecting their own shareholders and their equity in the firms. The consequences of this mistake are huge. Again, it wasn't accidental. This wasn't just random delusion. It was prevalent because so many people were making so much money. As soon as the casino goes bust, they want government to bail them out. Now, that's not a free market. That's uh, socialism on the uh, downside and capitalism on the upside. If Greenspan and Rubin had really believed the ideology that they preached, they would not have bailed out the SNLs the way that Greenspan did. They would not have, Rubin would not have bailed out the, the uh, Wall Street holders of Mexican bonds in 1995. Greenspan would not have bailed out the stock market in 2000 and 2001. The only explanation I can have for this is that it's a class question. These people were protecting their class. And what class was that? That was the class, global class. Because of Spain and Turkey and a number the of The network leaders of financial wheeler dealers who had essentially uh,
dominated the world economy. Wall Street and the wealthiest 1% now tell us that government is running out of money. They want us to believe that Social Security and Medicare cuts are needed, that the eligibility age for Social Security should be increased to 70. Permit me to start with one number. $53 trillion in today's dollars is what the country owes, is projected between our future liabilities, our national debt, and our huge unfunded promises for programs like Social Security and Medicare. Pete Peterson uh, and the Concord Coalition come in and say, oh my God, we've got these enormous deficits. And instead of focusing on the cause of the deficits, which are the Reagan and the Bush tax cuts, they then say we have to take an ax to all of these middle class entitlement programs. Peter G. Peterson, a multi-billionaire who was one of the founders of Blackstone, which was a private equity company. He gave a billion dollars to set up the Peter G. Peterson Foundation, which hired uh, the former head of the GAO, Government Accountability Office, uh, a man named David Walker, it's the price we to go around the country and crusade for the idea that what is wrecking the economy is not people like me, Mr. Peterson, but what is wrecking the economy is Social Security. That's why I appointed the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, based on a proposal ori originally presented by uh, a bipartisan group of senators. trying to convince these 18 people that Social Security is solvent. It is not uh, affecting the debt. It is not the way to solve the debt. The way to solve the debt is to create more jobs. I think we're in a situation now where I, ha where I have to modify my philosophy. Um, a little bit and maybe, maybe a lot. I'm just being totally honest. The guy comes up and says, I'm gonna do away with Medicare. I will campaign against him like you have never seen because I'm a beneficiary of Medicare. The guy who wants to get rid of Social Security. I put a whole lot of money into Social Security. I want mine back. And I'll tell you what I think, uh, and I may be going out on a limb on this, uh, but I think that the Obama administration is very worried about what we call a capital strike, a strike of capital, in the sense that if you really push these guys too hard, they can say, oh, really? You don't want us to get bonuses? You want us to be accountable? You want to know about our illegal behavior? Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to freeze up credit completely and your economy is gonna go tank, and good luck to you, Mr. President. The big banks can make such threats today because they operate with no fear of criminal penalties. The folks who are in charge of running this economy ran red light after red light after red light and caused car wreck after car wreck after car wreck, and no one's held them accountable. There hasn't even been a conversation about accountability. In 2005, the U.S. Supreme Court stacked with pro-corporate justices, overturned a conviction won by the Justice Department against accounting firm Arthur Anderson implicated in the Enron scandal. Now, incredibly, the government tells companies to police themselves. The Justice Department's current position is that a company can escape criminal prosecution if they just promise to change their behavior. You would think that Congress would say, who caused it? Who are we going to hold accountable? Are people going to jail? Where's the prosecution? You would think that would have happened, right? Hasn't happened. And the banks are still the most powerful lobby on Capitol Hill. Uh, and they, frankly, own the place. As of 2011, 
Not one corporate CEO, bank executive, or politician has been criminally prosecuted for crimes leading to the economic meltdown of 2008. If you really did the investigation, uh, the Democrats would not be able to simply say, oh, it was those, that, that George W. Bush, it was him. Well, you know what? It was a lot of Bush. But I'm afraid the Republicans would be able to say, sorry, not just us. Take a look at Robert Rubin, Secretary of Treasury under Bill Clinton and all of the Rubin guys. They were working with Alan Greenspan. They were working with Phil Graham to deregulate all of this stuff. So you got true bipartisanship. Everybody wants bipartisanship, you got it. And the memory of Ronald Reagan being enshrined in this country as some kind of a great leader is a crime. Um, the memory of any of the Republican leadership or, or the Democratic leadership, for that matter, over the last 25 years, being as anything other than conspirators in the theft of America, is a crime. We didn't actually clean up Wall Street. We actually didn't slay the beast. <laughs> we actually put them on life support, and they've been off healing and mending themselves and doing quite well. For 30 years, we've been turning up the heat on average Americans slowly. And it's been turned up at such a slow pace that if you say this is a crisis, people look at you as if you're weird. When the majority of the American public can no longer feed their families, we're going to have a crisis. And that's where we're headed. We don't want to see our way of life go away. We don't want to see our standard of living decline dramatically. That's what's at risk. What we've seen over the last 30 years is a deliberate transfer of wealth from middle class and the poor to the very wealthiest people in our country. The game is fundamentally rigged, and the ordinary people who do everything right, who play by the rules, still end up with the short end of the stick. I don't think people have a good understanding of how low wage incomes are in America from work. One third of jobs in America pay less than $15,000 a year. Now, that includes part-time workers and people with two small jobs. But half make less than $25,000. Three quarters make less than $54,000. 99% make less than $250,000. In reality, working Americans have been pushed to rely on credit to make up for the lack of growth in wages even as corporate profits skyrocketed. Wages have stagnated since 1973, despite increased worker productivity. Instead, the benefits of Americans' hard work have gone to executives and shareholders. What does the Bible denounce? The Old Testament, the New, and the Koran, all of them denounce again and again and again with a really powerful word, denounce as evil it is taking from those with less to give to the rich. I don't want to create a country where there is a landed gentry, where because you happen to make $5 billion, the next 20 generations of your children will get all the best spots in all the best colleges. Nonsense. That's not what America is about. Instead of a society in which we're struggling together to deal with environmental crisis, to deal with education, to make sure that all of our people have health care. We are a society now in which, which the goal is to be one of those people on top that have tremendous wealth and tremendous power. Everybody was shocked by Hurricane Katrina and by the, 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 you know, these images of poor African Americans and other people uh, abandoned, st you know, stuck on rooftops, waving American flags for two, three, four days, holding babies without a drop of water, without the U.S. government, the, the richest country in the world, being able to get them a scrap of food after three, four, five days. People were shocked, and it was shocking. But what nobody wanted to address was, it was the logical, necessary, inevitable outcome of 30 years of public policy that both parties had championed, saying, 
If you're poor, you're on your own. If you're poor, sink or swim. Uh, it, it, and it's better for you. It's morally right that we won't help you if you're poor. You should pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and if you can't cut it, you should be left to sink or swim. There are only two kinds of power in America. There's organized money, and there's organized people. One thing is really clear, the powerful corporate interests have had it good for so long, they're not gonna let go without a fight. And I think that we have to be very clear about that and ready to fight back. And I say we fight back with organizing, we fight back with good policy, and we fight back with, with strategies that are about achieving victory. The people who do the work, we're not the problem. The problem is the political system that's trying to divide us, the political system that's given tax breaks to the rich and the ultra-rich that they don't damn well need. That's the problem. We now know what we're up against. And while there's no magic remedy, Americans have the ingenuity and the drive to fix our economy. Even one national initiative, taking private money out of public elections, could tip the scales back towards democracy. I mean, the answer ultimately is, is public funding of elections, I must tell you that. Because so long as elected officials are dependent on the huge sums of money that they are to get elected, uh, these guys are ponying up the money. Professional lobbyists and lobbying firms and law firms that work with the Congress all the time should be absolutely prohibited from giving money to people who serve in the Congress. Because the bottom line is right, they are buying votes. Now, people won't, don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that their congressman or their senator is selling votes, but they are. Our greatest primary task is to put people to work. This is no unsolvable problem if we face it wisely and courageously. It can be accomplished in part by direct recruiting by the government itself, treating the task as we would treat the emergency of a war. When we did all the great things that we did in this country, we did it as a matter of national security and collective self-interest. So you look at, look at the, the railroads. Uh, you look at the interstate highway system, uh, you look at the internet, you look at any of the things that uh, really fundamentally changed the way our economy worked. Uh, it wasn't done uh, fundamentally on a market basis. Under capitalism, if nobody spends, nobody works. That leaves only the government to step in and spend. Your wife passes out, she's had a heart attack on the floor. Who do you call? You call the local government, and you expect the local government to do something. What is more important in this country than a teacher? What is more important than a policeman? What is more important than the, than the person at the SEC who's trying to save your 401 from going down the tube? Government's not evil. Government is sometimes incompetent. Right, government is unresponsive. Government isn't held to a, a, a sufficiently tight mandate. But government can do things that private citizens cannot do. Restoring our nation's economy will require creating millions of jobs, reining in military spending, and rolling back Reagan and Bush tax cuts for the wealthy so that we have a fair and progressive system of public financing. And the ideology that says, well, it's every man for himself, that's not civilization. Well, I say, people talk to me about taxes, and I say, taxes are the price of civilization. You don't want to pay taxes, we can all go back, live in caves, make our own clubs, we'll be fine. Nobody needs to make $500 million a year. Nobody's entitled to it. I would take the Glass-Steagall Act and put it right back in place so that we restored some kind of economic sanity. The guys from Wall Street who are running the Treasury and in the White House have so far 
refuse to do what they need to do, which is to take over the banks. Fire the people on the top. Get rid of those bad loans as best you can. Downsize the banks and send them back out into the market, not to make loans to each other, but to make loans for people to build factories, to build things again and compete in the world. I think local banks and credit unions are an absolutely critical component to any healthy community, big or small. If you don't have localized lending and localized decision making, you are effectively saying, take my deposits and invest them elsewhere, we're not worthy. Credit unions have always played a major role in their communities. The Federal Credit Union Act was, was uh, approved in 1934 and signed by uh, was President Roosevelt. Credit unions came to the rescue and they gave out loans to their members who really needed the help. And now fast forward to today, we're doing very much the same thing. I was with one of the big banks and the checking fees kept going up and up and up and I decided to give the credit union a try and I've been with them ever since. The democratic aspect of a credit union is that there's an equal footing between the, the board of directors and the at-large membership. Uh, we're not there for outside stockholders. Our investments are local. Uh, the money is recycled into the community to make our communities stronger. It doesn't matter if you don't have very much money. Every dollar you spend counts. We are voting with our dollars every day. Oakland's 81-year-old Neldum's Bakery closed its doors during the economic crisis, but employees organized and formed the bakery into a co-op, a worker-owned and operated business where the profits are shared among the worker owners. The shop reopened with a plan to better meet the needs and tastes of the local community. The business itself is doing quite well. Uh, the, the employees seem to be uh, uh, genuinely interested more so than before because it's it's they have an interest in the business it's it's not just they're working for the paycheck it's better now yeah and in, in all the ways it's better so yeah it's that's my job and i like to do it and i like to help customers when they're here when you spend your money at a local business and the local guy then in turn does business with other locals that's a recirculating dollar staying in the community and roughly 30% more of your money stays in the local economy when you choose to spend it at a locally owned business. I don't think profits are an evil word, or that's the problem. It's the blind, relentless, soul pursuit of profits that ends up wrecking the planet. The most critical part of any modern economy is energy. But the expensive and scarce fossil fuels that now power the U.S. economy are harming people and the planet. A new New Deal, a green New Deal, could make massive public investment in a new energy infrastructure that will put millions of unemployed people back to work and help save our planet. We're starting to figure out there's only so many light bulbs we can change and so many bicycles we can buy. And at a certain point, uh, getting carbon emissions down is going to take a collective effort. And that is a you know, major challenge to retrofit a nation, to repower a nation. It's never been done. We need to look at you know, a World War II level mobilization. I mean, you know, Detroit was turned in two years from making cars to being the arsenal of democracy. We have all these cities where that used to be the hubs of incredible manufacturing capacity that now sit idle. During the 70s and 80s, we shipped all of our manufacturing overseas. We, we demobilized these entire workforces uh, that are largely communities of color um, that are left now idle, and we can put them back to work. Why not, if you're gonna do $15 billion to General Motors, why not just put a $15 billion purchase order on the table for wind turbines, right? Uh, enough wind turbines to actually beat global warming. Uh, General Motors is not called General SUVs or general cars is General Motors. Well, the motors we need right now are in those wind turbines. 8,000 finely machined parts in each wind turbine. 8,000 parts, that's a car.
a resurgence of the labor movement is terribly important, not just if we're going to defend workers' wages and workers' rights and workers' bargaining power directly, but if we're going to have an institutional counterweight to the power of Wall Street. I'm Brad Lutz, a 13-year educator in the great state of Wisconsin. My wife is also a 13-year educator. What does that mean to us? That means we're going to get jolted twice as hard by these magical repairs of Governor Walker's budget repair bill. Polls show upward 50, 60 percent of American workers say, yes, if I had the chance to join a union, I would. Well, a union organizer comes in, and suddenly the boss says, you, you meet with him and you're fired. Well, he says, well, isn't that against the law? And the boss says, you're fired. Sue me. The labor movement is a cornerstone of a democracy because it gives people a chance to play a role in their future. It gives people a chance to play a role in the future of their community. It gives people a chance to play a role in the future of their country. The government wants to throw away 50 years, 50 years, people, <clears throat> of managers and workers solving problems together, not separate, together. That strong history of Wisconsin's collective bargaining rights are at stake. Our state motto is forward. This sounds backward. From Wisconsin's capital, to Occupy Wall Street, to demonstrations around the world, democracy advocates are confronting corporate power and refusing to back down. People are beginning to experiment with challenging in a populist way, challenging the bailouts, challenging the huge payouts. These are beginning signs that people are waking up slowly, and I call it evolutionary reconstruction, building from the bottom, challenging at the top, aware, I think, and this is critical, that this is not just an election, this is not, quote, a revolution, this is a long-term rebuilding of the entire basis of a system. And that's a hard thing for people to grasp, that that might be where we're at. Oh, OK. Don't All right. Good, good. I'm your neighbor. And, Hello. <laughs> but, and, and, and I'm All of that begins at the grassroots level. It begins at ordinary people knocking on doors to invite their neighbors to come to gatherings to understand how did we get into this mess as a country, and to understand that we'll only get out of it when people find their own voice and their own power. In Richmond, California, a town of 100,000, a small group of angry citizens found their voice and banded together to force Chevron Oil to pay its fair share of taxes. We are running for city council because for way too long, as Mike said, corporations have run our lives. The Richmond group fought hard and won, passing a proposition that levied a yearly $20 million tax increase on Chevron over 400 times the size of its previous tax bill. The people were able to get, first of all, get the signatures on the ballot. And once it was on the ballot, Chevron put about, oh my gosh, I think it was like a quarter million dollars to beat that initiative. And of course, we're grassroots and we're a community and we didn't have much money. I think we may have had I don't know, something like $20,000 maybe from contributions and donors. And despite that, we won. Chevron filed a lawsuit to overturn the measure, but ultimately backed down and agreed to pay the city $11 million per year. When people come to the plate and organize, then, you know, it's, it's the little David beating this huge giant. of having a strong media presence is unquestionable. I mean, we need very powerful, positive media representation. And if we're not getting it from the mainstream media outlets, then we got to create it ourselves. Some people are hurting their feet or hurting their ankles. We give out, like, ice packs and stuff. These medical supplies came from all over the country. People donated them, which was, like, heartwarming. This is a comfort station. Essentially, we provide warm, dry clothing, uh, tents, blankets. We have men's socks, uh, women's socks, men's shirts, women's shirts, men's pants, women's pants. 
umbrellas, tarp, everything to keep everyone comfortable while they're camping out here. Basically, we're getting a lot of donations, and with those donations, we're using that to buy supplies and food for everyone. One of the things that faces Americans is to build something beyond traditional capitalism, beyond traditional socialism, that is American in character, that builds an unbelievable American tradition. To me, what the American dream was about, and what, what is and what the hope is in it, is that people get to live up to their full potential. You get to create who that is. And to me, that hasn't been lost. What's been lost is the part of the American dream that was this sort of white picket fence, 2.5 kids, and some big SUV in the driveway. We have to recast what that means now to have a much more inclusive dream and vision about what it is to, to be uh, in this country, to making a life in this country. There's an opportunity to reframe the American dream. We all know that big money talks, but let's not allow it to silence the rest of us. If we work together, we can create a national strategy to revive our democracy and save our economy. We've seen how democracy was sold to the highest bidder and what we have to do to get it back. The next steps are up to us. The question will be asked and the question will be answered what kind of species we are. You know, are we locusts? Just, you know, are a curse on the planet? We're busy, we're working, but what we're doing is so heedless and so destructive, we leave nothing but disaster in our wake. Or are we honeybees? You know, honeybees work hard too, but they fit in with the ecosystem and they actually are a blessing on the planet. They're a blessing to all creation because their work actually makes more life possible. Now, that's our challenge as a human species to be honeybees. It's time to end welfare as we know it and get those greedy chiselers off the dole. It's time to end welfare as we know it. Teach them a little self-control. For far too long we've allowed these corporate hogs 